Today I have for us an interesting set of two stories which, although you may not necessarily be familiar with the sources from which they originally derived, you'll certainly be familiar with the archetype of the story itself. Our first story comes to us from the Philopsudes, or the Lover of Lies, by the ancient Greek novelist Lucian of Samosata, a man who lived sometime around 125 to 180 AD. This Philopsudes work as a whole is chiefly satirical in nature and intended to mock superstitious people who lived during the time of the Roman Empire. And the following is a brief but very famous excerpt of that text, so please enjoy. The Story of Eucrates and Pancrates by Lucian of Samosata. I will tell you another story, said Eucrates, derived from my own experience, not from hearsay. When you hear it, perhaps even you may be convinced of its truth. When I was living in Egypt during my youth, my father had sent me traveling for the purpose of completing my education. I took it into my head to sail up to Coptus and go from there to the statue of Memnon to hear it sound that marvelous salutation to the rising sun. Well, what I heard from it was not a meaningless voice, as in the general experience of common people, Rather, Memnon himself actually opened his mouth and delivered me an oracle in seven verses, and were it not irrelevant, I would have repeated the very verses for you. But on the voyage up, there happened to be sailing with us a man from Memphis. One of the scribes of the temple, wonderfully learned, familiar with all the culture of the Egyptians. He was said to have lived underground in a crypt for twenty-three years while learning magic from Isis. Oh, you're talking about Pancrates, said Aragnotus. He was my own teacher, a holy man, always clean-shaven, deep in thought, dressed in white linen, speaking Greek with a thick accent, tall, flat-nosed, with protruding lips and skinny legs. Yes, that Pancrates, said Eucrates. At first I did not know who he was, but when I saw him working all sorts of wonders whenever we anchored the boat, in particular riding on crocodiles and swimming in company with the animals while they fawned on him and wagged their tails, I recognized that he was a holy man, and by degrees, by being kind to him, I became his companion and associate, so that he shared all his secrets with me. Eventually he convinced me to leave all my servants behind in Memphis, and to go with him alone, for we would not want for attendance. Thenceforth, this is how we lived. Whenever we came to an inn, the man would take either the bar from the door, or a broom, or even a pestle, dress it with a cloak, utter certain incantations over it, and make it walk such that it appeared to everyone else as human. It would go off and draw water, buy provisions and prepare meals. In every respect it served and waited upon us perfectly. Then, when Pancrates was through with its services, he would again make the broom a broom, or the pestle a pestle, by saying another incantation over it. Though I was very keen to learn this power from him, I could not do so, for he was jealous of it, despite being most generous in every other matter. One day, however, by hiding myself in a dark place, I secretly overheard the spell, only three syllables long. After telling the pestle what it had to do, he went off to the square, and on the next day, while he was transacting some business in the square, I took the pestle, dressed it up in the same way, said the syllables over it, and told it to carry water. Once it had filled an amphora and brought it back, I said, Stop! Cease carrying water! Be a pestle again! But now it refused to obey me. It kept straight on carrying until it flooded the house with water by pouring it in. I had no idea what to do, for I feared that Pancrates might return and be angry, which is exactly what happened. I took an axe and cut the pestle in two, but each part 
took up an amphora and began to carry water, and now instead of one servant, I had two. In the meantime, Pancrates returned to the scene, and realizing what had happened, he turned the servants back into wood again, as they were before the incantation. Then, without warning, he left me to my own devices, disappearing out of sight to some place I know not where. So now, said Dinomachus, do you still know how to turn a pestle into a man? Yes, indeed, he said, though only halfway, since I cannot bring it back to its original form once it becomes a water carrier. So if I perform the incantation now, we'll end up with a house flooded with water. The End So I hope you enjoyed that one. Surely it was familiar to many of you. And now we turn to a 19th century English folk rendition of the tale of the Sorcerer's Apprentice. This one is entitled The Master and His Pupil, and it was drawn from the appendix of William Henderson's Notes on the Folklore of the Northern Counties of England and the Borders, and first published in 1866. In good English fashion, this fairy tale takes on a distinctly Faustian flavor that is lacking from Lucian's account, and I think it's just delightful to see some of the ways in which this ancient Egyptian tale is recast in a necromantic 19th century European Christian light. So please enjoy The Master and His Pupil. There was once a very learned man in the North Country who knew all the languages under the sun, and who was acquainted with all the mysteries of creation. He had one big book bound in black calf and clasped with iron, and with iron corners, and chained to a table which was made fast to the floor. When he read out of this book, he unlocked it with an iron key, and none but he read from it, for it contained all the secrets of the spiritual world, it told how many angels there were in heaven, and how they marched in their ranks, and sang in their choirs, and what were their several functions, and what was the name of each great angel of might. And it told of the devils of hell, how many of them there were, and what were their several powers, and their labors, and their names, and how they might be summoned, and how tasks might be imposed on them, and how they might be changed to be as slaves to man. Now, the master had a pupil, who was but a foolish lad, and he acted as a servant to the great master, but never was he suffered to look into the black book, hardly to enter the private room. One day the master was out, and then the lad, impelled by curiosity, hurried to the chamber where his master kept his wondrous apparatus for changing copper into gold and lead into silver, and where was his mirror in which he could see all that was passing in the world, and where was the shell which, when held to the ear, whispered all the words that were being spoken by any one the master desired to know about. The lad tried in vain with the crucibles to turn copper and lead into gold and silver, he looked long and vainly into the mirror. Smoke and clouds fleeted over it, but he saw nothing plain, and the shell to his ear produced only indistinct mutterings, like the breaking of distant seas on an unknown shore. I can do nothing, he says, as I know not the right words to utter, and they are locked up in yon book. He looked round, and see, the book was unfastened, the master had forgotten to lock it before he went out. The boy rushed to it and unclosed the volume. It was written with red and black ink, and much therein he could not understand, but he put his finger on a line and spelled it through. At once the room was darkened. The house trembled. A clap of thunder rolled through the passage of the old mansion, and there stood before the terrified youth a horrible form breathing fire, and with eyes like burning lamps. It was the evil one, Beelzebub, whom he had called up to serve him. Set me a task, said a voice, like the roaring of an iron furnace. 
The boy only trembled, and his hair stood up. Set me a task, or I shall strangle thee. But the lad could not speak. Then the evil spirit stepped towards him, and putting forth his hands touched his throat. The fingers burned his flesh. Set me a task. Water that flower, cried the boy in despair, pointing to a geranium which stood in a pot on the floor. Instantly, the spirit left the room, but in another instant, he returned with a barrel on his back and poured its content over the flower. And again and again, he went and came and poured more and more water till the floor of the room was ankle deep. Enough, enough, gasped the lad, but the evil one heeded him not. The lad knew not the words by which to dismiss him, and still he fetched the water. It rose to the boy's knees, and still more water was poured. It mounted to his waist, and Beelzebub ceased not from bringing barrels full. It rose to his armpits, and he scrambled to the tabletop. And now the water stood up to the window and washed against the glass, and swirled around his feet on the table. It still rose. It reached his breast. In vain he cried. The evil spirit would not be dismissed. And to this day he would have been pouring water and would have drowned all Yorkshire had not the master remembered on his journey that he had not locked his book and had therefore returned and at the moment when the water was bubbling about the pupil's chin spoken the words which cast Beelzebub back into his fiery home. The End